summer for many years, the Society has held a programme of urban and landscape walks. We can't do that this year, but I hope you'll join me today in this stroll around Barmouth, looking at its role as a seaside town during the Victorian period. This is where you've got to use your imagination. We're standing in the main car park. 200 years ago, in around about 1810, this area was still sand dunes and beach. It was part of the Gorsigadal estate, and behind me you'd have seen this wonderful mountain backdrop, very romantic, but you'd also have seen what was described as a new town on the beach with showy fashionable shops, because already in 1810, Barmouth was a place that people came to enjoy the sea bathing. We know that because there's a, uh, an advertisement for a coach which brought visitors from the Feathers in Chester. They left Chester early in the morning, got to Barmouth late the same night, three times a week in 1827. At the same time, there was a Barmouth coach from Shrewsbury. And there's a lovely account of a, a group of people who got into the coach at the Lion in Shrewsbury, eight o'clock one morning, travelled up the A5, which was the brand new Telford Road, just opened, and they got as far as the Druids, where they changed into what they describe as a beaten down old coach, went by Valor and Orgesli, and arrived in Barmouth at 11 o'clock the same night, tired and straight to bed. A few years later, Charles Darwin was in the town, and he was walking on the beach with Samuel Taylor Coleridge, just weeks before he sailed off in the Beagle. So B Barmouth's history as a seaside town goes right back to the beginning of the 19th century. And we're going to go now and have a look at the Bath House, which was built in 1819 for the use of visitors. So we're standing now outside the Bath House. The original Bath House was built by the Corsi Estate in 1819. It cost the estate £45, and the accounts for it are still in the archive at Bangor University. And in the original bathhouse, visitors to the town could have hot and cold water plunge baths. That was part of the sea, sea, seaside cure, if you like. As well as the bathhouse, people would have swum on the beach, but it wouldn't have been swimming as we understand it. The purpose of bathing machines then was to haul you out into the ocean, and there would have been a lady aboard with good strong arms who would have plunged you down into the sea and that was part of the cure. We just wait until this car goes past. And as well as swimming in the sea and plunging in the sea, you were also expected to drink seawater. You would drink seawater by the pint and this would cure all ills known to man, allegedly. Um, the original bathhouse was operating right up until the 1860s, 1870s, and so thousands of holland makers would have come down to this spot over the years to take the water cure. They clearly needed somewhere to stay. And so what we're going to do now is go and look at one of those examples of the kinds of accommodation that was put up to provide lodgings for these visitors. Marine Terrace, our next stop. So here we are on uh, the Marine Parades, sitting down outside Marine Terrace. As I said, this part of Barmouth, um, until the 1850s, was all part of the Corsi Gedel estate owned by the Boston family. But in the 1850s, they sold up most of their land in Merioneth, and they embarked on um, the development of Clandino. It's interesting to think what might have happened had they chosen to stay here. But anyway, they, they sold up. And this area of land by the 1870s was owned by a company called the Barmouth Estate Company. That was a, a group of Birmingham-based businessmen, including one Mr. A.A. A. Corder, sorry, Major A.A. A. Corder, 
and they created the whole of this west end of Barmouth effectively, beginning with Marine Terrace. Many of the houses that they built were used as accommodation for um, visitors and spared a thought for the generations of landladies who kept places like this going. In the 19th century many of these were widows and this was a rare um, opportunity that they had for financial independence. Some of them were younger working class women, often from surrounding parishes, who came to Barmouth again to find some measure of um, financial independence. Others, if they were married, were supplementing their family incomes. Marine Terrace was fronted by Marine Parade. This was, throughout the 19th century, the main promenade in the town, and its upkeep was a constant source of dispute because it was argued the council wasn't maintaining it to the standards required. It was described by one visitor as being like the rocky road to Dublin. And John Allsop, the atelier, he was at one stage the manager of the Marine Hotel, which is behind me, he said that unless it was improved, they might as well shut the whole place up. Marine Terrace was always one of the premier sites in the town. Sir Peter and Lady Ratcliffe and their family came here for more than one summer and at any stage in the summers in, in the 19th century you would have seen groups of people walking along this promenade enjoying the sea which would have been lapping not very far from where I'm sitting now. Our next stop though we're going to leave the West End, this residential development and go and look at the harbour um, which is a little way in that direction. So here we are, we walk down now to the harbour and of course Barmouth was primarily a port and a shipbuilding centre right up until the 1850s. Thirteen ocean-going vessels were built in Barmouth between 1840 and 1859. In the 1851 census, 25% of the working population of Barmouth were involved in maritime trades, fishing or sailing or shipbuilding. But this changed with the coming of the railway in the 1860s. Immediately its work as a port declined. Within a year the harbour master had his salary halved because uh, trade through the port had fallen off so very much. And rather sadly one of the last cargoes that was described as arriving in the port was a cargo of railway sleepers. In 1858 Emily Tennyson uh, stood roughly where I'm standing now looking across the estuary to um, Kada Idris and she was concerned because her husband Alfred was climbing the mountain and as she stood here she saw a storm coming across the mountain and this is what she described she said I never saw anything more awful than the great veil of rain drawn straight across Kada Idris pale light at the lower edge it looked as if death were behind it. And indeed, Alfred did get into difficulties. He couldn't get down the mountain back to Barmouth and he was helped by his guides to go down into Dolgethlai instead. Later in the century, about 1895, a visitor to Barmouth rode across this estuary late at night. He had with him as a guide an ex-Indian army man, so he was a good man, and they sailed, rode across the estuary and then they climbed Kadir Idris at midnight. And this is what he had to say about that. He said, it was a fitting occupation for those with hard muscles, a stout heart and a cool nerve. This, I think, is one of the most superb views in Barmouth, looking across the estuary, across the railway bridge to Kadir Idris beyond. But close by to the harbour is the Chapel of Ease. And that's going to be our next port of call. Chapel of Ease, St David's. Why a Chapel of Ease? Well, the parish church, Barmouth Parish Church, was in fact in Hanaba, which is about two miles northwards in that direction. And when English visitors were in the town in the early 
19th century and wanted to attend to their devotions, they didn't necessarily want to walk two miles to the church. And so the Chapel of Ease was built to accommodate them here in the town. The width of this traffic goes past. And this is a reminder that even 30 years before the coming of the railway, there were enough visitors in the town to build a church like this, more or less, just for them. But next, let's go and look at the place where the road was blasted through the hillside to bring those early travellers in the 19th century into Barmouth. We've just stepped down a little from the main road to avoid the wind and traffic noise. But that's a, a super shot you've got of the rock that was blasted through to create that road at the end of the 18th century. Because until then, the only way to get into Barmouth was either by sea, and I can see the route the ships would come in as I'm standing here, you'd have come in by sea, or you'd have come across the old track that led across that mountain behind the town. This, this road that opened up Barmouth to visitors because it connected not only with Harlech northwards and beyond, it also connected inland with Dolgetlai, Welshpool and Shrewsbury. And so those visitors that we saw leaving Shrewsbury in their coach early in that morning uh, at 8 o'clock and getting here at 11 o'clock at night would have passed along the road, this very spot. And it was roads like this that made it possible. But of course, it wasn't just the roads that opened up the town to visitors. The roads needed a whole network of services. They needed posting houses because the horses had to be changed. They needed inns because people would stay overnight. And so a whole new technology almost was developed to provide that system. And that system was bringing visitors into Barmouth for something like half a century, more than half a century, before the railway. And it was the railway that was the next big technological development, and that's the next thing that we're going to go and have a look at. It's just a little way along in that direction. So here we are, I've just walked down the road from the railway bridge and what we can see behind us is Porkington Terrace. This was the second premier residential site in the town. And if you look closely, of course, we're not looking at a terrace, we're looking at a series of rather handsome semi-detached villas. Why is it called Porkington Terrace? Well, Porkington um, is the, uh, an anglicisation of Briginton, which was the name of the Harlech estate outside Oswestry. This land belonged to the Ormsby Gore family, but eventually became ennobled as Lord Harlech. So this was Ormsby Gore land, not Corsigedal land, and Porkington is a reflection of that. Interestingly too, it wasn't built by a, by a, by a, a, a corporation, by a, by a company. Most of these houses went up during the 1870s as individual developments. The land was leased by the Ormsby Gore estate and individual people, mainly local people, built these houses. But again, most of them were built as accommodation for visitors. And some of the visitors were distinctly grand. You can tell this from the visitor lists. You had people like Lord and Lady Brownlow Cecil who spent their honeymoon on Porkington Terrace. The visitor lists are fascinating. When people arrived in the town, they signed the, the visitor book, obviously. Their landlady or the hotel manager would pass this on to a central bureau, and those lists were then published in the local press. So you could peruse them and presumably look for or avoid, as the mood took you, uh, other people that you saw on the list. 
People didn't always take them seriously though. And during one summer uh, on Porkington Terrace, we found staying Anthony and Cleopatra, Julius Caesar, Napoleon was a visitor one year apparently. So people didn't always take them seriously. And interestingly, a, a group of young men were camping out on the sand dunes in the 1890s and they were rather discomforted because they went to sign the visitor book and they were told that people who were camping on the sand dunes didn't really qualify for entry in the book. So there we are, Buckington Terrace, and this is our view now out, well it will be soon, our view out to the railway bridge across the Malbach. It's not coincidental that Porkington Terrace is where it is because it commands probably the finest view in Barmouth as a, as, a, as a residential address. So we walk now across the railway bridge. So, isn't this just the most tremendous view? This railway bridge was built, well the railway opened in 1867. A phenomenal feat of engineering to span the, 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 the breadth of this estuary with this railway bridge. And for the first time it was possible to get into Barmouth by rail. This was about 20 years after the North Wales Railway was built before the Cambrian came along. But it changed access to the town dramatically. Already as we've seen the, the, the town was getting visitors, but after the railway opened, there was an explosion in the number of visitors able to come to the town. Well, relatively an explosion. I mean, something like possibly 40,000 visitors a year came to Barmouth. If you contrast that with the 2 million a year that went to Blackpool, it emphasises that this was never a major, major, major resort. But what a tremendous position it had. So from the 1860s, people arrived in the town across this railway bridge. But the other interesting thing is that the bridge was designed to be used by pedestrians. As you see, there is a footpath. When it was first built, there were little embrasures with seats in, so you could sit along the, uh, along the bridge as, uh, as you were walking along it. Barmouth never had a pier, but as everyone said, why does it need a pier? This is the finest promenade in Wales. As someone said, no, 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 not the finest promenade in Wales, it's the finest promenade in Europe. And I think, you know, it's pretty conclusive that it is absolutely superb promenade. It's a lovely one to walk along, it's a super one to cycle along. You've got this marvellous view of the estuary, and if you're lucky, sometimes you'll see a whole bank of, um, oh Lord, I've forgotten their names, they, they sit with their wings open. Cormorants. Cormorants! <laughs> thank you, thank you, Andrew. You find a whole bank of cormorants just resting with their, winds with their wings open on the shoals beneath us. So this is the, 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 the railway that really transformed its life as a holiday town and we're going to walk back into the town now and have a walk along the high street. rather splendid chapel and it's one of a large number of chapels like this in Barmouth. This chapel now as you see is no longer a chapel it is a shop and the manager has very kindly the manager of pieces for places has allowed us to come inside and film inside but try to put your minds back to the days when this was a Victorian chapel and it's a reminder that Barmouth was a very strong non-conformist town and that was part of its appeal to a lot of its visitors. It was sober, it was temperate, it was respectable. John Freeman was a London tailor and he spent part of his holiday in Barmouth in 1875. And he had an orgy of theological tourism. He darted from chapel to chapel, from Presbyterian to Wesleyan. He heard, hold the fort for I am coming sung three times 
including once when he was very warmly welcomed to a choir practice. John said that the singing was really extremely good, apart from one occasion when the harmonium player sung along as he was playing and he had a fearfully harsh voice. Hold the fort, for I am coming, Jesus signals still. Wave the answer back to heaven, with thy help we will. A party of chapel girls left Manchester 20 years after John Freeman, 5 a.m. Whit Monday, 1891. And one of the chapel girls wrote up her account, and this is what she said. It was a company of the choicest kind. On the same seat sat dear old Mr. Hayes, deacon, who attended Rochdale Road Sunday School for 40 years and never been late once. And next me was Mrs. Lawton, who received a prize for good attendance long before Mr. Gadsby died. Nonconformist, conscientious, part of a close-knit community, these visitors found in Barmouth a resort that shared their values. standing outside Morris's Cambrian establishment and I've stopped here because this is a marvellous example of the growth of a strong Welsh middle class from the 1850s. A man called William Morris had a drapery here in the 1850s and he employed in 1851 one assistant. By 1891 the drapery employed five people and his three sons and he built these rather splendid premises. He had his house behind with a garden looking straight down to the sea. He was a member of the local council, he was chair of the school governors and there's an interesting point that when he built this development in the 1880s he moved it back three feet at the request of the council in order to put a parapet and I thought parapet that was the word they used for a pavement and it's a reminder that before then this road was very different to the road you see now. It was much narrower, there was no pavement, and in fact one visitor, before this building went up in the 1870s, described how he was walking along the street and he was pushed against the wall by a substantial drove of cattle. A reminder that the town would have smelt very different to the town that we have now. It was very much an agricultural centre as well as everything else. <laughs> we, have, we have a load of hay going past. Sorry, straw, wasn't it? Anyway, so. The town smelt differently. The sand dunes, we talked about the sand dunes, we were down by the beach. There were pigsties down there until well into the 1880s. And the Cambrian News said that they, they accepted that pigsties had to be had, but queried the fact that they were at the end of the marine parade. So that's a reminder too as you walk around the town. Instead of traffic fumes and other things, scandy floss, back in those days there'd have been a much more agricultural tang to the air around you. We're going to move on now and have a look at the Corsa Gedele Tell. So here we stand now outside the Corsa Gedele Tell. It's an hotel I've mentioned often in the course of this walk. It was built in 1795 originally by the Corsa Gedele Estate. It obviously capitalised on those new roads as I talked about that brought visitors through here and for the next well, the next century effectively this was the centre of uh, tourist social life in Barmouth. It was the premier hotel. It had a succession of landladies and landlords. The first was Larry Lois. Uh, she, she was a well-known character in her day. Then there was a man called William Barnett. He was a landlord for a long time and it was called Barnett's Hotel because of that. But the one I want to single out is John Davis. John Davis was the manager and eventually the owner during the 1870s. And John Davis was the man who was very much behind the transformation of Barmouth in that last quarter of the 19th century. In 1871, he arranged a meeting of town people to petition for the creation of a local board, basically a local council. And he said, if the people of Barmouth wish to make Barmouth a, famous, a favorite place of resort, they must make improvement in the sanitary state of the place. It was, he said, in many ways, 
a town of the 17th century. No mains drainage, no mains water. You had people queuing up in the summertime at wells and pumps to get water. John Davis himself had to send carts into the countryside one summer to get barrels of water to bring back to keep his hotel going. So John Davis created the local board and in the next 10 years he oversaw the development of mains drainage, sewerage, main water supply and a working town council. As well as that, he was an entrepreneur in his own right. He ran the Corsi Geddel, but he also built the assembly rooms. And we'll have a look at the assembly rooms in a second. Sorry, I said that we would see the assembly rooms. Well, of course, we're not looking at the assembly rooms, we're looking at where the assembly rooms were, because very sadly, they were demolished in the 1960s. But they were built by John Davis in, in, in 19, or oh, sorry, in 1876 ish, something like that. And there were 20 bedrooms, 20 sitting rooms, an assembly room where he held balls, dances, uh, evening parties, um, musical performances. Joseph Parry's opera Blodwin was performed in the assembly rooms. Um, uh, famous suffragists spoke in the assembly rooms. It was a centre of activity and life, a superb building and um, sadly now gone, I think it was demolished as I say, sometime in the 1960s, but John Davis, the man, the manager of the hotel, the creator of the local board, the builder of the assembly rooms, Barmouth owed a huge amount to him in that last quarter of the 19th century. But as I said before, most visitors to Barmouth came by rail after the railway was opened, so we'll head now and look at the railway station. As I said, once the railway opened in 1867, overwhelmingly, apart from the odd walker or later on the odd cyclist, overwhelmingly visitors arrived in Barmouth by train and thousands of visitors would have passed through those columns that you see behind me. Undoubtedly, the most famous of them all was William Ewart Gladstone, the Prime Minister, who in 1891 visited the town for a week's holiday. His train was hours late arriving at the station because it had been mobbed on route by uh, parties of people at every station. He'd only come from Port Maddock, and when he got here, presumably around this spot, a huge crowd of people had gathered to see him, and as he said in his diary, he was caught for a speech 20 minutes. So he stepped through the door, he came out here, he delivered his speech, and then he spent his holiday. And we know exactly what he did on his holiday because he kept an account in his diary. His account with God. He walked on the beach, he went for carriage drives, he went out to Harlech, he went round the castle, noble pile. He spent his evenings reading Homer, and when he wasn't reading Homer, he was working on a memorandum for Queen Victoria on the Irish question. Serious business, he said. But as well as Gladstone, of course, thousands and thousands of other people. And I love the accounts of him. Shortly after the railway opened, a party of tourists from the Wrexham Temperance League visited the town. They came by train from Bala uh, and, and Andalgetlai. They described coming down the Malvac. We never saw anything like this. And when they were in the town, they went for a walk up the hill, and there they were met by an old lady who showed them the old road to Dolgethlai. Another group of people, a thousand liberals, arrived by train from Cheshire, starting off at five o'clock in the morning. So every time I go to Barmouth, I think of all these people who arrive with great excitement to have their day or their week in the town. And the first thing they'd have seen coming out of the station, I can see it now in front of me, is St. John's Church on the hillside. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Well, here we are looking at St. John's Church. And as I said, once it was built in the 1890s, the first thing you would have seen when you left the railway station there, looming ahead of you on the hillside, was this church. And I'm quite sure that that was a very deliberate consideration when the site was being chosen. The foundation stone was laid in 1889 by Princess Beatrice. Beatrice was the youngest daughter of Queen Victoria. She was staying with her mother at Van Vervel. It was one of the Queen's 
very rare visits to Wales. I think she only came two, possibly three times during her entire reign. Some people hoped that she might in fact make the journey across to Barmouth to perform the ceremony herself. But at this stage she wasn't too keen to be travelling about the country laying foundation stones, so Beatrice was dispatched and the Queen noted in her journal that Beatrice had gone to us, Barmouth, mm, a seaside town. When this was built it had a capacity of a thousand. A congregation of a thousand people could get inside and it was designed very much with the visitors in mind just as St David's had been half a century or so before. And many of these visitors in fact had contributed to the cost of the new church. Famously and notably Sarah Perrins, Mrs. Perrins of Leon Perrins fame, contributed £15,000, equivalent to perhaps what? More than a million pounds in modern values. And as a result, instead of the more modest church, which had originally been planned, it was possible to build this rather grand and impressive edifice. Towering above the town, it symbolised Anglican authority. Anglican supremacy, rather a knockback for our Welsh disestablishists, gloated one Birmingham newspaper. Nor was it simply visually dominant. Gwynorra Davis was a Calvinist minister. He was also chair of the local council. He said, I hope I am as conscientious in the council chamber as I am in the pulpit. And Gwynorra actually wrote to the Bishop of Bangor complaining that every Sunday morning the bells from this church pealed across the town for a solid hour and that was repeated every Sunday evening for another half hour rendering worship in the chapels around the town, the non-conformist chapels, difficult if not impossible. Davis in fact had a long-standing disagreement with Edward Hughes who was rector at the time this church was built. Hughes one day visited the council officers, exercising his rights as a ratepayer to look at the books he wanted to check the figures. Davis appeared and as it said in the press, an altercation ensued. At one point Davis sued the rector for libel and he wrote publicly that no one could work with the rector unless he were his tool or his slave. This is a nice example of the tensions that sometimes arose between the Anglican Church and the mainly liberal non-conformist majority in the town. Well, St John's concludes our walk, our stroll around the town. But before we go, let's make one last visit. We'll go up to the panorama walk itself, as did so many of those Victorian visitors to the town. Well, you can see what I mean, that absolute tremendous view that we've just seen from the top of the panorama walk. We've just stepped a few paces down from the very top to get out of the wind which was relatively strong up there. As I said earlier, one of the first acts of the council when it was formed in the 1870s was to waymark the way up to the panorama walk. And from that moment this was part of the Barmouth experience that every visitor tried to experience. One wrote, and this was a man from, well it was a lady actually, from the Isle of Man, everyone goes to the panorama, she said. And sure enough, John Freeman, 
I've mentioned John Freeman before, he was the man who did the theological tourism in the town. John Freeman and his brothers walked up here one, uh, one day. They borrowed the guidebook from a friend in the hotel or another guest in the hotel who lent them her guide and they followed the, 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 the route in the guide up to the panorama. And this is what John Freeman said. He described it as a moderately high hill. Well, uh, you know, it's, it's actually quite, quite a good hill, actually. But a moderately high hill. And when he got here, he said he enjoyed the splendid expanse of water in Cardigan Bay and the winding Malvac enclosed by glorious mountains. He was grateful, he said, for the glorious weather. And we've got glorious weather, too. He was grateful for the glorious weather, which enabled us to enjoy tenfold the splendid works of our Creator spread out on every hand. And it is, remember the remark about the finest promenade in Wales, those people walking on that railway bridge, looking up the Malvac, this is what they were looking at. Must have seemed absolutely like heaven for them. And I'm afraid that's the end of our walk. Thank you for watching so far, if indeed you've watched this far. Thanks to Andrew, who's produced it, directed it, cameramaned it, and he's going to edit it. And it will be thanks to Andrew, it appears, not in print, but um, online. So thank you, Andrew. Hope when times are a bit more near and normal, you can come to Barmouth, enjoy the sea, enjoy the view, enjoy getting up to the panorama, and perhaps think about all those people who've been enjoying holidays in this town for a good 200 years.